morning, happy Easter. Let's stand and let's celebrate the risen King. And praise on the mountain. And I'll praise when I'm sure. And I'll praise when I'm down. He's when I'm numb. And praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the waters. My enemies drown. Oh, you got breath in your lungs, let's sing. As long as I'm breathing. And I'll praise when I know, all because I know. And I'll praise because I know you're still in control. My praise is a weapon. It's more than a sound, more than a sound. My praise is a shout that brings Jericho down. As long as I'm breathing. Come on. I know you got some movement in those bones this morning. The Lord woke you up. You got breath in your lungs. Let's sing. Now praise because you're sovereign. Praise because you reign. Praise because you rose and defeated the grave. Praise because you're faithful. Praise because you're true. Praise because there's nobody greater than you. I praise because praise you're sovereign. Praise because you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise. Praise cause you're faithful. Praise cause it's true. You believe it? Is one. 
worth the living just because he lives. I'll sing it again, church. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear, all fear is gone. And I know, because I know, he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he bled and died to buy my pardon, I hope an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Our church is seen because he lives. I can face tomorrow because because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he And this is our hope of heaven, one day. And then one day, I'll cross that river, I'll find thy smile, no war with pain. Come on. And then as death, do you have hope this morning? Gives way to victory. I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know He lives. Sing it. Because He lives, I, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. And I know, because I know. Because he lives. Oh, one more time. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the because he lives this life this life is worth the living just because he lives yes yes give him praise he is good it's a good day to be in the house of the lord together and we celebrate for this cause because on a sunday two thousand years ago Mary and some of the other women were going out to the grave to prepare his body with spices. When they got there, they were met by someone they didn't know. Turns out it was an angel. And he said something so profound. You know, Mary and the other women were at a tomb. And the angel says this. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, he's risen. That's why we celebrate today. There are risen king who we have hope in because we know that he holds the future. Church, can we continue to worship together? Lifting up our praise to the risen king, our King Jesus. Let's sing together and give him praise.
There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his light The darkest day in history They're on a cross they made for sinners For every curse is blood atoned One final breath and it was finished And not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake and the veil was torn What sacrifice was made As the heavens roared And all hell King
Let's continue to celebrate our risen King, the King who conquers death, who conquers the grave. Let's sing. And there's peace that outlasts darkness and hope that's in the blood. And there's future grace that's mine today that Jesus Christ has won. So I can face tomorrow for tomorrow's in your hands. And all I need you will provide just like you always have. I'm fighting a battle you've
joy. Father God, you have already won. You are the king above all kings. No one stands in your place. You reign above all. Lord, thank you for dying in our stead and giving us hope by raising on the third day so that we know that we will rise again with you. Father God, we love you. Speak to us through our pastor. May his words be your words. Open our ears and open our hearts to what you have to say to us this morning. God, we love you. We thank you. In Christ's name we pray and everybody say amen. amen and amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. If you weren't awake, you are now, so welcome. Um, such a cool time to be together on Easter, and if we just think about for a minute what we get to celebrate this morning. We were taken from death to eternal life. We got sins forgiven, and we didn't deserve it, and that, to me, is worth celebrating. I hope you guys feel the same, and I know some of you are in this room with that exact feeling, go, man, I'm here to celebrate and I'm here to party because I was given a gift I didn't deserve. But there's also some of you that you walk in, you're like, eh, I don't know if I'm supposed to be in church. Um, and to you, I would just say, the guy who wrote most of the Bible was killing Christians in his previous career, so you're more than welcome. Um, yeah, don't feel like church is not for you. It absolutely is. And if any of you are new, or even if you feel like you don't belong, we would love to connect and just let you know some about us, get to know you, so you don't have to walk in and feel like a stranger, because feeling like a stranger is not fun. So if you guys would like, there's all the ways to connect up there. There's on the app. There's people out in the lobby. There's a lot of different things, but we would love to get to know you and get that opportunity. Uh, the second thing, we've been given a ton, and part of what we've been given is financial resources. And so we're going to pause and just give the time for you guys to give your offering right now. If you came today, though, and you weren't planning to give, don't give. If you're like, man, I don't trust these guys, well, that's fine. Don't, don't give yet. Um, that's, we would not not ask that of you. But if you came planning to give, there's ways to do so. And there they are. The last two things that I want to talk to you guys about is this. Out in the lobby after service, there's going to be a bunch of people, a bunch of community group leaders. And what community groups are is it's just our way of getting people together to be able to discuss what is talked about on a Sunday morning. Because turns out, if you spend 30 minutes listening to someone one day of the week, it usually isn't quite enough to impact your life. And so we want people to get together and be able to talk in groups. And we also realize everyone's different. Messages hit people differently. People have different questions. And so we need to do something that kind of fits to you as an individual, and groups are our way of doing that. So you get together, you talk, you connect. And so if you are interested in that, and you know, you're like, hey, I want to sign up, there will be leaders and people in the lobby, and then we're going to give you a whole bunch of donuts to just, you know, keep you there talking. And so all the donuts are for everyone. If you don't sign up, just feel guilty eating them. Uh, just kidding. You don't, you don't need church guilt. It's fine. Just eat your donuts. Take a few extras if you want. Uh, but you're welcome to join us, eat those, and if you have questions you want to sign up, go there. If you, though, are this morning, you're like, you know, slow down, like pump the brakes. This is the first date. I'm just getting to know you a little bit. Um, there will be a room right out. There actually is a room. We will be in the room right out these doors over here on the bottom floor. If you balcony people go downstairs and go into the room over there, and in there we will have a community group kind of question and answer time and we'll just give you a feel of what community groups are if you have more questions and you're like, I'm not ready to just sign up yet. That's where to go if you have questions. The last thing we have that we want to announce for you guys is our marriage workshop. And for some of you, you hear workshop and you're like, hmm, too intense. Um, so here's what, what it's going to be more like. It's going to be more like date night and we're going to give you food and provide childcare, and then give you a little structure and a few things mixed in, but it will not be like, tell me what your problems are. <laughs> You're not going to get any of that. Believe me, there's going to be way too many people, way too awkward. We don't want that either. So it'll be just, it's going to be kind of a structured time for you and your spouse to connect, and we want to help you do that. And so we're providing dinner and childcare and a couple questions along the way, but the space is limited because we're going to feed you all and it gets a little crazy. So uh, sign up on the events page, on our web page, or on the app. And with that, we got a video for you guys.
so fun. I even see people wrapped around in the balcony and students up there. Awesome to see y'all. Uh, happy Easter. There's this elderly woman, and she was walking home from her church Easter service. And when she got to her house, she surprised an intruder. She found him huddled over her jewelry box going through it. She came up behind him and she yelled, Stop! Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And the, the robber just froze, put his hands in the air and did not move a muscle until the police officer arrived. The officer cuffed him and the lady explained exactly what it is she did and exactly what it is that she said. And as the, the cop was walking the guy, the burglar to, uh, to his cop car, he asked him, he was like, why did you stay there the whole time? Like, all she did was quote to you scripture. He's like, scripture? No, uh She said she had an ax in 238. <laughs> See, um, <laughs> sometimes when Christians speak, the message gets a little mixed up. So I'm gonna try and avoid that today. And I'm going to try and be super, super clear. We are here to celebrate that Jesus claimed he was going to die for us and three days later come back to life. And he died on a cross and three days later he came back to life. And his resurrection is the hope of our resurrection that one day on the other side of this life we will be with God together forever in heaven. How clear is that? Hopefully it's really clear. But I want to back up to that Sunday morning. On that Sunday morning, it was about 5 a.m. and the, the sun wouldn't actually rise for another 30 minutes. And there, there's just enough light in the sky that the three Marys could see the path right in front of them, the path to the tomb. And yeah, I, I said three Marys. There were three Marys that were all there. One of them, uh, Mary, she was the wife of a guy named Cloppus. I know, unfortunate name. We don't know anything else about her or about Clopas. And uh, then you have Mary, who's the mother of James. James was one of the disciples. And then you have Mary Magdalene. Her life was radically changed by Jesus. She had met him years ago. And it seemed to me that Mary Magdalene, she was leading the way. But she had been there Friday at the crucifixion. She had seen it all. And in the dark, they were actually carrying these baskets of, of myrrh. It, it's an ointment. And as, and as they walk, you can imagine the, the fragrance of this comes up into their noses. And as they walk in the dark to this tomb, they were actually going there to finish what the men had started on Friday night when they began to pray, prepare the body of Jesus. They were going to go finish the job. They were going to prepare his body for a, a proper burial because he was dead. Now, the disciples, the disciples would have joined them, but the tomb was actually surrounded by Roman guards, which meant that it would be dangerous to approach. This was a job for the brave. This was a job for the women. The problem was they didn't really have a plan when it came to the whole stone thing that covered the entrance of the tomb. I mean, which one of them was strong enough to, to move it because all of them had dropped their CrossFit classes years ago? Maybe Mary Magdalene, who was leading the charge, would just bat her eyelashes at the Roman guard and he might help them out and let them pass. That tomb, as they're walking, was just around the corner. Wait, wait. The stone's gone. It's not over the entrance to the tomb, and there's actually no Roman guards present. There's no one there. And with fear, they peer inside the tomb. And the scripture reads, when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. The women that morning found an empty tomb. As they stood there trying to make sense of it all, these two men appeared. They never heard them walk up behind them. They just appeared, and they asked, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He's risen. I mean, alive? There's no way he's alive. All three women had watched as Jesus was nailed to the cross that, that Friday afternoon. They watched as a spear had been piercing his side. They watched as the Romans took down his lifeless body, gave it to a guy named Joseph of Arimathea. 
Jesus was dead. But the two men speaking to them in that moment claimed that he was alive, and they're trying to make sense of all this, so they keep speaking. Remember how he told you? While he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then the women remembered his words. See, it's not that he never died. Jesus died, but he came back to life. And the question is this, did the women trust what they were told? I mean, were they absolutely convinced in that moment? Did they trust what these men had just told them? So they run to the disciples to tell them what had happened. But it was Mary Magdalene who lingered behind. She lingered at that tomb and she was just beside herself because we know a little bit of her story. You see, when Jesus found her years ago, he found Mary broken. Her life was in shambles. She was unloved and unwanted. But Jesus didn't avoid her like everybody else did. He loved her. He put her life back together. He healed her and helped her realize that she was actually loved by God. And now he's gone. And she just broke. And she was unable to hold back her tears. And she just, she just wept. But it was in that moment that everything changed. It says that this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she didn't realize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? It's kind of a funny text. It says, thinking he was the gardener. I don't know what that means. She said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. See, Mary still doesn't trust what she had been told. She heard the words that he was alive, that he's not dead, but she did not trust because she had a trust problem. And Jesus then said to her, Mary, she turns and looks at him is what the scripture said. She turned to him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. She saw him. She finally saw him. She heard him. She held him. And she finally trusted that he was alive. And that's the resurrection story. But it reveals to me this. <clears throat> we live in a world that has trust struggles. I mean, one of the biggest issues in our culture today, it's trust, right? I mean, we don't trust what we read. We don't trust what people tell us. We don't even trust the photos that we see online. Shotani, uh, <clears throat> or Shohei Otani, highest paid pro baseball player, right? Caught up in a scandal last week. And the story, as it was told, just kept changing. If you're not familiar with this, the story began where his interpreter, it was believed that his interpreter was gambling Otani's money. And he was gambling it on baseball, a big no-no in the baseball world. Then it became the interpreter had actually stolen money from Otani. And the third version was that Otani was actually paying off his interpreter's gambling debts. And before it was all done, it raised this question if Otani was actually the one placing the bets. The story just kept changing, and you keep asking the question, who do you trust? Who do you trust to give you the accurate story? If you've spent any time on Instagram, you know that photoshopping pictures is not uncommon, right? People will change how they look in a photo to be a little slimmer, stronger, shapelier, or whatever. And we know that the, photo, the, the social media photos that we look at most of them, if we're honest, they're staged moments. They're not captured in just like, a, oh, hey, just shot this picture. Look how great it turned out. And so we don't believe the stories we're told. We don't, read, we don't believe, trust what it, what it is we hear online. We don't even trust what it is that we see with our eyes when people say, yes, this is true and this is my life. Here's our struggle. <clears throat> we don't know who to trust. And so our struggle is this. At the very best, we struggle to trust some. At our very worst, we don't trust anyone. Does this describe your life at all? Maybe you're a super trusting person. <clears throat> trusting is one word for it. Maybe naive is the other. God bless you. <laughs> Most of us, though, have trust issues. Here's what's so 
Interesting, what happened that Sunday morning, there were trust issues there beyond just Mary. Who do you trust to tell you the truth? Whose version of that story? Because if you know this and you've read this in the, in the Gospels, there's other versions of that story. Here's the first one. It's the Roman Jewish version. Here's their version of the resurrection story. It was the disciples' deception. And you can follow along if you want. There's some notes in there and you can grab a pen. You can write some of this in. That the disciples must have deceived everyone. So even though the Romans and the Jews, they didn't get along. The Romans controlled. The Jews didn't like their control. What brought them together was they had a common enemy in Jesus. In this common enemy, they, they banded together to share a version of their story. Here's how this reads in Matthew 27. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests of the Jewish community and the Pharisees of the Jewish community went to Pilate, the Roman governor. <clears throat> Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, here it is, his disciples may come and steal the body <clears throat> and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. So Pilate, Roman governor, he, he, he heeds the warning of the, these Jewish leaders and he places guards at the tomb and it states that they had sealed the tomb. Roman guards, trained killers. If the disciples show up, they don't stand a chance, or at least that's what they thought. But after Jesus' resurrection, listen to what Matthew writes. Some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests and <clears throat> everything that had happened. The report kind of went like this. Listen, you won't believe this. Like the earth started shaking and all of a sudden there were lights in the sky and there were like these angels there and the stone started just like rolling away even though no one was pushing it. Like we got the heck out of there. That's my loose interpretation of the Bible. <clears throat> the story continues. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took this money, this bribe, and did as they were instructed. And the story's been widely circulated among the Jewish community to this very day. The story, according to the Roman and the Jewish version of this, is that the disciples just deceived everybody. They came and stole the body away. It, it, isn't that kind of funny, though? Roman guards. Tomb sealed. They were sleeping, supposedly, is the report in the Bible. Just tell them y'all fell asleep. Roman guards sleeping while men came and rolled away. Multiple men came and rolled away a huge stone. Man, they must have been tired. <clears throat> this Roman Jewish version um, has all kinds of problems with it, but here's what's interesting. It's not the only version of the resurrection story. There's another one that is raised by academics. Stay with me on this. As centuries passed, it became more and more difficult for really smart people to believe that somebody could come back to life and that God could do that. So some people developed this story that's known as the, the swoon theory. Sounds like an odd name, right? The swoon theory is simply this. Jesus, after being whipped 39 times, which killed most people, and then made to carry his, the cross beam of the cross up this hill to Golgotha, <clears throat> once there, nailed to a cross through his feet, through his, his wrists, hanging there for six hours, and then to verify that he was dead, the Roman put the spear in his side, and they all watched this. At that, the, the Roman guard was called to Pilate, and, and Pilate said, I want to verify that he's dead, and the Roman soldier's like, I'm good at this, right? I, he's dead. And then they take his lifeless body off a cross. Joseph of Arimathea places him in this tomb. And the swoon theory is this. Jesus didn't die on the cross. He just passed out. He swooned. And in the cold, damp tomb, he revived. And he didn't come back to life. He just recovered. Okay? That's a version of the story by academics. Just so you're aware of this, um, like where does that come from? Is that like a first century person who watched the crucifixion and drew his conclusions? Uh, this was actually written in 1780. Seven, 1,700 and probably 30 years, a man came up with this who was a pastor, but just so you know, he was fired and barred from every theological school and church he ever worked for. His name was Carl Frederick Barth. There's all kinds of problems with this theory. I've already hinted at an awful lot of them. 
But one of them is this, when the women saw Jesus alive that morning and then that evening, he shows up to his disciples. And for the next 40 days, the scripture records and claims that he met with people, hundreds of people. It never says that Jesus was recovering. He didn't appear partly alive or like barely alive and recovering. He appeared fully alive. Now, the third version is Jesus's version of the story. I don't know if you know this, but just a week before his resurrection took place, um, we talked about this message last week. There's a guy by the name of Lazarus. He was dead for four days, one more than Jesus. You thought three days dead was a miracle. I mean, he was dead four days and Jesus brings him back to life and all these people watch this miracle. And he makes this statement. He says, I'm the resurrection and I'm the life. He's claiming, I got power over death. You think death is bad? I got this. I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who trusts in me will live even though they die. The fourth version of the story is the disciples. Jesus' version, the disciples' version, they kind of go together here. The, the disciples' version goes like this in the scripture. It says, Jesus showed them his hands and side, and, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Their version of the story is, listen, I, I don't have to make this overly complicated. We saw him die, and then we saw him alive. We touched him. We held him. We saw him. We talked to him. We, we had a, a meal with him. So here's what's interesting. When you get different versions of people's stories, I think we should ask this question. It's this. How does each version benefit the storyteller? How does each version of their own story benefit the storyteller? I know some of you are looking at me like, what does that mean? Here's an example. The Roman Jewish leaders, for them to hold their story and say, this is true, the disciples stole the body, what does it benefit them? Well, they're actually trying to retain power. They're trying to retain their popularity. People are leaving their movement from the Jewish faith and going, oh, this Jesus, we're going to follow him. The Romans were all about control. And you know what the sign said over the cross over Jesus' head? It said, the king of the Jews. And the Romans were like, no, 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 there is no other king other than Caesar. The Romans and the Jews had this in common. They're trying to retain control. If Jesus comes back to life, they start losing control. Another quick example, the academics. What does it benefit them to hold their story? Well, it's interesting. If you can make Jesus not resurrected from the dead, you can essentially make him not God's son and all of his claims are false, which means this. The academics get to be their own God. They don't have to ask God, God, how should I live? Jesus, how do you want me to live? They can say, I can live however I want because I'm the God of my own life. And what's interesting, I think, is that you don't have to be an academic to live that way. Jesus' version of the story, what does it benefit him? <laughs> Jesus' version of the story goes like this. He comes down from heaven, teaches us, proves who he is, claims to be the son of God, and then proves who he is through all of his signs and his miracles. And then he dies on the cross saying that I'm paying for your sins there. What is Jesus' version how does it benefit him? It doesn't benefit him at all. Then what drives him to come down and die on a cross for us? It's simply this. He loves us. And when I say us, I, I hope you'll substitute the word you, that he loves you. And that's what drove him to it. Now, the disciples asked the question, what did it benefit them to claim that the resurrection really happened? We saw him after he died, like he's, he's alive. Like, what did it benefit them? Here's what's interesting. Out of all the disciples, every single one of them was martyred for their faith, except for one. They were crucified on crosses. They were beheaded. They were stabbed to death. And some were killed by dropping large stones on them. All because of this. They said, I'm sorry, I, I've seen him alive. Change your story. We'll kill you. How do you change the story? What drove the disciples? What did it benefit them to keep their version of the story? It didn't benefit them at all. What drove them this? I think what drove them was this. It was just the truth. They just couldn't deny the fact that they had seen him dead and then seen him alive. If you want to write this down, this is interesting. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6. It says that Jesus appeared for 40 days after his resurrection. He appeared to hundreds of people. And at one occasion, he appeared to more than 500 of them. And the writer of the letter, Paul says, listen, more than 500 people saw him at one occasion, many of whom are still alive. As if to say, you don't believe me? Go ask them. They saw Jesus. So it begs this question. 
And it's a much more personal question. It's not an academic. It's, it really is the question of the day. Will I trust Jesus? I know we have trust issues. But will you trust Jesus? After the resurrection, um, John, one of his followers, he wrote down what it is he saw and experienced with Jesus. We have it in what's called the Gospel of John. And at the very end of his book, he tells us why he wrote it. And it states this, Jesus performed many other signs. He's referring to miracles, signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these signs and miracles are written that you may believe. Now, the word for believe, faith, and trust is this Greek word called pistis. It's all the same word. So I'm going to take the word believe and put the word trust in here. These are signs are written that you may trust that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by trusting, you may have life in his name. Today, will we trust that the story is actually true? Because if the story is true, it comes with these massive implications that if Jesus promised that he's going to die and then come back to life and he pulls it off, you have to ask yourself, can I trust everything else he said? Because he said this, I'm going to die as a ransom, as a payment for the sins of this world. At the very end, John writes this. It's so interesting. He says, then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, he's talking to one of the disciples that, that, that like visually saw him and touched him. Because you've seen me, you believed and trusted. And then he says this, blessed, happy are those who have not seen and yet have trusted. That's us. You weren't there 2,000 years ago. I wasn't there. But happy are those people, blessed are those people that when you hear this story, you're like, I think it's true. I mean, we have access to so much technology today and so many resources where we can read from people who are actually there that day. We have so much that can convince us. And so we, it just begs the question, do you actually trust that the story is true? Because if the story is true and Jesus said, I'm going to go away and I'm going to prepare a place for you, it's the promise of heaven. And he, he predicted that before his death. Do you trust that he died and came back to life? Because the implication is that there's a life after this life. And he's like, I'm the only way to get there. You have to trust me. So I think it might make sense for us to end this way. What does it mean to trust Jesus? Remember, my whole point for this is I just want to be really, really clear and not give a mixed message. So here it is. I think it's number one this. We trust Jesus' claims about us. I'm sorry, about him. I'm going to trust Jesus' claims that he made about himself. So here's what he claimed. He claimed he's the son of God. That's who he claimed to be. He claimed that he would die as a full payment for our sins so that we can't earn anything. To get to heaven, listen, you can't do anything to get there. I can't do anything to get there. Christian faith is so different than every other religion of the world. Every other religion of the world says this, you better behave yourself. You better do these things and earn God's favor. The Christian faith is the only faith in the world where, faith, where salvation has already been done for you by Jesus. You can't earn it. All you can do is receive it. His resurrection, I believe, proves his claims are true. And his resurrection means that you're going to have resurrection one day. That if you're one of his who received this, that there's heaven for you. So the first is this, trust Jesus' claims about himself. Here's the second part. We got to trust Jesus' claims that he makes about us. And we're going to call this repentance. Here's what Jesus claims about us. Ready? The first one's kind of simple. There's no perfect people. Isn't that a nice way to say it? <laughs> There's no perfect people. Let me say it a different way. We're all messed up. We're all sinners. That's how the Bible describes it. Every single person in the world. Let me put it in context. Have you ever done everything you said was the right thing to do? No way. I haven't. Could you imagine trying to do everything that God wanted you to do? There's no way that we ever lived up to his standards. We didn't even live up to our own standards. Our sin then separates us from God. That's what Jesus claims. But here's what's amazing. We're offered this great exchange, and the great exchange is this. If I admit my sin, and I say, Jesus, I believe that you paid for that on the cross, it's like I'm giving it to him. 
God, you get my sin, my guilt, and my shame. He doesn't get the best end of the deal on this, right? In return, we receive forgiveness and a relationship with God where we are loved. And listen, whatever we get on earth, we get in eternity. You want Jesus now, you want God now, the way that Jesus says you can have him, you want it now, you get it in eternity. If you're like, yeah, there's time for that, I don't want that now. And all of a sudden, eternity's there. You get whatever you wanted down here. And that could be life without God. So we're offered this great exchange. And I hope that's great news to you. Here's the third thing. I think it's about trusting Jesus' direction for my life. I'm gonna call this following. Will I actually follow him? We trust that he's always with us. We trust that his ways are good and best for us. So we follow his ways. It means we commonly ask this question. Jesus, what, what do you want me to do? I mean, it's not like, hey, Jesus, I, I got, which cereal should I eat this morning? Apple Jacks, Fruit Loops. Like, I don't care. But listen, you didn't come in here today asking what cereal to eat. You came in asking, I wonder what my life really matters for. Why did God make me? How did my life become a mess? Following believes this about Jesus, that he's actually good and he's good for us and he's good to follow. It doesn't mean life is always easy, but he promises that he will always be with you. So here's what I'd love to do today. I think it makes sense on the clarity of a message that I've stated some of these things as clearly as I know how, and I think it begs this question. Is today a decision day for anybody? I just want to present you with some options. Here, here's the first one. Uh, you might not know Jesus well enough to trust him today. You don't trust anybody the first time you meet him, right? If this is your like, first time hearing this story, you're like, man, it sounds like everybody knows the story. I don't even know the story. And like, now I, I know part of the story. You might not know Jesus well enough to trust him today, but you could decide this. I'm going to commit to get to know him. I mean, there's a Bible in the chair in front of you. That's what that little black book is. Take it with you. Read the Gospel of John. You could commit to actually reading that and, and actually meeting with some Christians and asking the question, like, what does this mean? Help me understand this. I mean, we have so much technology today. You could download on your phone right now, go to your app store and download the U version, Y-O-U version. And there's all these reading plans about how to, how to get to know Jesus, how to get to know what the scriptures claim about him. So maybe your decision today is this. I, I don't know him well enough to trust him yet but I can commit to get to know him. Maybe that's a, a three-month commitment. Hey, for the next three months, I'm just, I'm gonna get to know him. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in. I'm gonna start reading. Some of you might be like, oh, I'm not a reader. You know, there's this crazy thing called Audible, like it'll tell you. Like, there's so much technology, we have no excuses. Maybe that's your decision. I'm gonna get to know him. For some of you though, listen, may, maybe your parents took you to church when you were four and five and it was their faith and it wasn't your faith. And you hit your teens and your 20s and it became very clear it was not your faith. And you know this story's true. But you have not yet received it. And you've never had that great exchange. Maybe today your decision is this. Today is the great exchange day. I believe that that's actually a historical event. Even our calendars hinge on it. And I'm going to decide, I'm going to make a decision today. And I'm going to admit, yeah, my, my life, I'm what the Bible calls a sinner. I'm broken. I'm not perfect. And you can't have anything less than perfect, perfection in heaven. So listen, Jesus is going to take your sin, your guilt, and your shame, and you get to give it to him because he died on the cross paying for all that. And you get to walk away being loved by God, no longer carrying your guilt. And you can have a relationship with God today that when you pray, he promises, I will hear you. He even promises that he'll answer. He might not answer exactly how you wanted him to answer, but he'll answer. And then when you slip from this life to the next life, you will immediately be in God's presence. Do you remember Jesus dying on the cross and this thief who was dying next to him? Says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He tells him, you can be assured, today you'll be with me in paradise. Maybe today's decision day for you and that's going to be your great exchange.
Um, can I speak to many of you who are in this room? I know there's, I look out, there's so many familiar faces. So good to see you. I know you're a believer. You had the great exchange years ago. Um, but maybe for you, listen, I'm not leaving you out of Easter. Easter has something for you. <laughs> Because the truth is that if, if his resurrection is true, which we believe, then he can be trusted. And so maybe the question is this, ask him, how do you want me to follow you, Jesus? Maybe you're, you're in a job and you're focused on all kinds of other things than really asking Jesus, Jesus, how do you want me to live? God, what do you have for me? Because I think a life of following Jesus is such a great adventure, but there's so many people who are bored with the monotony of life because you're not asking the question, Jesus, what do you want for my life? Because here's what he's gonna do with you. He's gonna use you to introduce people to who he is and you're gonna help change other people's lives. There's nothing greater that you could do with your life. Maybe your question is this. I'm a follower of Jesus, but maybe I need to ask him, how can I follow you? And it's not gonna make you more Christian or more saved. You can't do that. But maybe you could ask him those questions. So here's, here's what we're going to do. I, I know in your programs there, there's a card in there. And it's a decision card. And I, those three questions, they're laid out in that decision card. I just want you to contemplate and think about that. I'm going to have our band come out here in just a moment. And uh, I just want them, to, I want them to kind of sing a celebration over us. Because in just a moment, I'm going to walk you through that card. And I'm going to ask you, is there a decision that you want to make today? And it's no manipulation. I'm not going to force you into this. I mean, this is between you and God, right? Well, I'm going to ask you this. So maybe take a look at that. As our band sings, I just want you to have this moment with God that you might ask him, God, can I trust you? Because I believe this after walking in with him for more than 40 years. I know I can trust him. And I hope you have that experience today as well. Oh, shame is a prison as cruel as a grave. Shame is a robber and he's come to take my name. Oh, love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Love is the power where my freedom song is found. There ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down. There ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down. When I hear that trumpet sound, I'm gonna rise up out of the ground. There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down a smooth and velvet tongue. Fear is a tyrant. He's always telling me to run. Oh, love is a resurrection. And love is a trumpet sound. Love is my weapon. I'm gonna take my giant style. There ain't no
in celebration in, in just a minute. And when we get back into that, don't hold back, all right? Take it to the roof. But right now, there's something super, super important. I want you to grab this. It's a decision card. It's in your program. I, seriously, don't look at me. You're looking at me. Why are you looking at me? Grab it. I hope you're, oh, you're holding it, right? And I want you to grab a pen. If there's a decision to be made today, it's a decision of life. I mean, the first is, right? Here it is. I don't know Jesus yet, but I commit to getting to know him, so one day I might trust him. Check that box if that's you. And see, I, I don't do this out of, let me try that again. Woo! I don't do that out of manipulation. I do that out of clarity. I want you to be clear on this. So if that's you, whatever it looks like for you to get to know him. Second is this, I declare my trust in Jesus today by exchanging my sin for his forgiveness and love. It's the great exchange. And for some of you, you need to do that right now. And by the way, I'm not gonna call you up here and be like, come on down. Like, I don't want embarrassment and the social pressure to stand in the way of you making a decision to become a Christian. And let's be super clear, box number two, that is a decision to become a Christian. That's what it is. For some of you, that's your decision today. Check that box right now. And for some of you, you're a follower of Christ, but if you're sensing like, man, I I am a Christian, but I got questions about my following. (laughs) I'm not sure I'm living the life that God wants for me. Check that box. And then here's what I want you to do. Write your name on it. Do it right where it says name. And then right below that, it's even bolder. It says email. You know what I want you to write there? Your real email. Here's why. You're going to say, your your name's going to be on here, and you're checking, this is my decision today. I will not spam you for the weeks and months and years to come. I will send you one email that will be our encouragement to you. And that way, you will know how to email me back. If you have questions like, Pastor, I... I need some help with this. I'd love to talk. Or, you know what? My life is broken and I believe there is forgiveness, but man, I don't know how Jesus wants to put my life back together. I got some questions. We'd be happy to answer those questions or meet with you or encourage you. But here's what I believe in this room, that this is a moment that will change some people's eternities. And so don't be shy about it. There's nothing, there ain't nothing that can hold my body down. That's what Jesus claimed. And I'm gonna have you sing it in just a moment. There's nothing that can hold your body down, hold you back from Jesus other than you making a decision that says, I'm in. And so I hope you'll do this. I want you to do exactly what I asked you to do. And then on your way out, there's gonna be some ushers with some baskets. You you can just put it in there and we will send you only one email. (laughs) And I believe this though, right around this room right now, I believe that there's people who are making decisions in the balcony. This is your first time back at church in 30 years? I don't know, 10 years, five years? Maybe it's your very first time and you just, something in you is just calling you out to trust him. That the story's not only true, but that he loves you. And he has a life for you today and a life for you tomorrow. So hey, let's all stand together because if those decisions are being made around this room, which I believe, we're gonna sing this song in celebration. So take it up, guys. Let's sing, church. Oh, there was a battle, a war between death and life. And there on a tree, the Lamb of God was crucified. And he went on down to hell and took back every key. And he
if you walked out of the grave I'm walking to If you walked out of the grave I'm walking to If you walked out of the grave I'm walking to If you walked out of the grave I'm walking to Yes Lord Sing it sir if you walked out of the grave, I'm walking through. Say goodbye, death. If you walked out of the grave, I'm walking through. Come on now. If you walked out of the grave, I'm walking through. Come on. If you walked out of the grave, I'm walking through. If you walked out of the grave, I'm walking through. Come on, church. If you walk down the grave, I'm walking to. If you walk down the grave, I'm walking to. praise this morning. Thank you for joining us this Easter. I pray this morning as Pastor Scott led us through those three decisions, you made one of them today. And as you leave today, would you let us know about it? Father God, thank you for being our resurrection and our life and giving us the hope that we can trust you. God, I love you. God, we thank you. And it's in Christ's name that we pray the risen king in the church set. Amen and amen. You are dismissed. Happy Easter.